Okay, let's get started. <laughs> you should have a piece of paper like this. If you don't have a piece of paper, raise your hand and I'll pass them up to you. Does anyone have paper? And now you also need to have a pen. Everybody has a pen? Okay. All right. <laughs> so this evening we're going to talk about time series data. You've already done a little bit of exploration of time series data. That was intentional. But before we get to that, <laughs> all right. Before we get to the time series analysis, we're going to review the, the homework that you did. And these are posted on Blackboard. So anything that you're seeing during this little demo here is in Blackboard. All right, let's pull this up. All right, so the first assignment was the six-sided die. Who thinks that that one was the easier one, just out of curiosity? That was easier than the power data? OK. All right. So I'm going to be showing a student's homework. If the student wants to volunteer that they raise their hand and want to like comment, that's also acceptable. But I'm just going to walk through this. Basically, what I was looking for at the end, the way I graded these, was just look at the plot. Right? If they got the plot, that implies that the code is probably valid, unless they're just making up fake data. It would be hard. So uh, this was, uh, only a few people went with this style of plot. So I, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's very easy to see like there's a biased versus unbiased roll of the die there. So, yeah, yeah. So they had a, a data frame with the outcomes of each set of roles, and then they used the bar plot in the of the data frame. And they basically took to get that one data frame, they concatenated two data frames, and they had these these functions here of the biased and unbiased role. So. Every, so everyone's notebook for this section was slightly different. The, and I'll let you go back and like look at that. But All right. So another chart, which I wasn't quite as much of a fan of. I'm generally not a big line chart person. But I'll just to skip to the, the punchline here. So like, tell me if this is a biased or unbiased eye. Like, visually, it's just hard to do, right, compared to this other one, well, OK, yeah, I guess number five was the biased die there because it's 0 to 5. So like, you can sort of see that. But from my sort of analysis, it's not quite as pleasant to look at because the line chart is interpolating values between 4 and 5. Right? So I'm, I didn't take points off for a line chart. It wasn't like the wrong thing to do. But my advice to you is, unless you think it's valid to interpolate between points, a line chart is generally not a great choice to go with for this type of data. So again, the other issue that I saw with this data was neither of their plots started from zero. So here you're seeing it start at 3,200. And that's why like, there's a, it's accentuating the difference, right? Because it wants to show as much variation of the plot as you see. Same thing here. This is just hard to see. It would look like a flat line if, it, if the base were at zero. So again, not like overtly wrong per se, but not as easy to digest as other plots that we'll look at. Just keep that in mind. So line plots, generally not the right chart for categorical data like this. This is almost categorical, categorical data. All right, let's see what they had this one. All right, this one was pretty standard. So you've got like a bunch of bar chart outcomes and then showing the bias. One issue that I saw in a lot of notebooks was people would select like 30 or 60 rolls of the die 
that's enough to get you some data. But if you did like 6,000 or 100,000, it's very clean data, right? And the cost of doing that is the difference between like 0 0.001 seconds and like two seconds. So not a lot of computational cost from your perspective. Let's see. There were some that were, so I think this one, I marked it as the most concise one because like this was basically all of their code. So they have a weighted die and a fair die. They even put them in functions, sort of not super necessary because I mean, they're just being used once down here for the plot. Then they plot the outcome and those are the two plots. So it is pretty concise to do that way. This one had a lot of comments, which I, I enjoy comments. And like it's not some like crazy pleasure source, it's just me understanding how you think. So if you ever get comments, feedback, it's usually I need more comments. But here they walk through all of their logic about what they were thinking as they wrote the code, which when you're going back and reading it, if you download these from Blackboard, you'll be like, oh, that's why they're doing this. And you'll sort of hopefully understand the, the value to comments by reading someone else's comments. And I thought this one was very good with that. So can they combine their, their bar charts into this outcome? So it doesn't look at. Any questions on those? The codes are really posted, so I didn't want to like spend a bunch of time diving through every line, but it's all there. All right. Now for the power data. All right. So there were a lot of different approaches to solving this problem. As you might have figured out, the problem was the displaying the big chart. All right. So this, again, on my grading sense, this was very easy. If I see this chart, you're done. I don't even have to look at your code. Generally, it's looking pretty good. Sort of the outcome there. This is like a for me, the reason I did this is because I want you to like gain some familiarity with like, oh, this is what the bar chart looks like for every hour and 24 hours, like gaining some familiarity with that plot. Then you have this harder problem of going back and solving this. Okay, so this one was pretty well done in the sense of you can, if, so in black, in, uh, in the notebook, you can like click on it and it blows up to the larger size. And you can see that they're labeling the dates. And so like that corresponds to every 24 hours, they have a new date, so. Yeah, so th they did it manually here, which not a big fan of it, but <laughs> that's one way of solving it. I'll, gu I'll give you a couple other ones. So this one, I, I think I liked this one, the, the approach here. Let's see. So again, same plot there. But then they changed the orientation, right? And so let's see. Yeah, they're just setting the ticks on the top and right and left of it. So that reorienting this, let's see. Yeah, so bar H, that's a horizontal bar chart. So that was the trick there. That one was a, still a little bit crowded, but because they made it really big, aspect ratio works for the screen. You can see the hours and days relatively well. And then, oh, let's see, one more. This was another vertical chart that I can pull up. So here they labeled it with the hour and the day, and again, made it very big. This one was a little bit cleaner, um, so it's only labeled on one side. So there's lots of different orientations. And then this other one over here, other people just like made it really big, and that's totally valid to do. So this is, again, like if you click, like it's nice, right? Because you can sort of see the pattern, and then if you really want to know like what hour and day was this, you can just click and zoom in. There to go. So, I mean, that, nothing wrong with that solution. It still works. It's just, you know, different ways of exploiting Jupiter. All right. I think these other, this last one is basically the same, I believe. All right. Yeah. So they made it really long, and made it nice and big. So. But just advertising, those exist. You can look through those. None of these is any more right than the other as far as like getting the point across. They are posted in Blackboard currently, yes. Okay. So uh, last week, we tried to cover the entire domain of math in one course. Obviously, that wasn't successful. <laughs> Today, we'll cover all of time series. Uh, and then the other thing that's going on in the background is your project two proposals. So there's two comments on this slide. One comment is, what do I want and what do you want? And so this big circle over here, that's what I want you to aim for. 
So somewhere like you're pushing yourself to learn and explore a new data slightly larger, asking some different questions of the data. Um, so I don't want you to do things that like aren't challenging. And also, you shouldn't do things that you don't know how to do at all. So again, that's a subjective choice there. On the subjective side for me, <laughs> um, I always aim for like trying to impre impress the customer. So this is like my O face. I'm like, amazing. That's, that's fantastic, right? Like if you can provoke that response out of me, that's a good thing, right? Like, <laughs> and not that like, oh, oh no, like <laughs> that's the wrong O face. <laughs> so you want a happy Ben, right? That's sort of the goal there. And like, that's very challenging. Like this is the same problem you'll face trying to impress your instructor as you'll try to impress your customer when you're out in the real world. So like, this isn't, you know, it's an unfortunate coincidence, but it's a good teaching moment also. All right. Yeah, so we're going to talk about time series and a little bit of linear regression. If you're in 602 or you've heard anything about machine learning, you probably know about linear regression. Right, so last time we talked about math for a whole course. This time we're going to talk about time series. There's actually, I found three different courses at UMBC covering this topic. So me trying to cover it in one lecture is also inadequate. So I again apologize in advance for that. This is a really deep domain, and yeah, I'm going to hopefully advertise to you why it's so applicable and interesting and challenging. All right. So basically, the first question, what are we talking about here? And hopefully, we're starting on the, on, the, on the easy end here. Basically, we have something where you've got times and you've got observations, something that happens, some recording, either a, a log or a, an event. And this time series thing, you notice the, the similarity with the the pandas data type series, that's not a coincidence, right? Like, let's, a panda series has an index and a value. It's the same concept here with time series. And then you're like, wait, we could do uh, multiple observations in a given time point, and that starts to look like a pandas data frame. How convenient. <laughs> All right, that was my maniacal laugh. <laughs> so it looks like a pandas data frame, which means we could use pandas to do time series analysis. That is great news for 601. All right. All right, so now, now we're gonna use your paper that you have on your desk. And a pen if you have one. If you don't have a pen, let me know. So this is a two-step activity. The first step is working by yourself independently. You will write down a couple time series that you're familiar with. So we just described what a time series is your task to think about what time series am I familiar with already? Thanks. You'll need three of these. Okay, so you're gonna write those down. I'm not collecting these sheets, but I will be aggregating your answers on the board. So I'll ask, so, so this is like a self-selection criteria, but who here has not volunteered an answer in front of the class before? <laughs> what's something that you wrote down? What's, what's something that you wrote down on your paper? So if like, uh, if we have some sensors, like which is collecting data on the question, can I have to use the calculate or okay. like at a particular time, So the keyword there was sensors, right? Sensors. Okay. 
who else has not volunteered an answer before? Okay. Credit card what was it? Credit card transaction. Card transactions. Online transactions. Card card transactions for credit card. Okay. So fa financial transactions. Another one that he mentioned was uh, financial transactions, uh, online sort of like online events, online commerce. Okay, I don't know how to spell. All right, who else has not volunteered before? Everyone, that's I'm surprised. Everyone has volunteered an answer before. All right. Anyone else? Temperature. Okay, so we'll put that here. Stocks. Yeah. What's the weirdest answer someone wrote down? Of what? Am I something more specific? Mm, so how, is that a time series? Okay, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> so, sorry. Event studio. <laughs> event schedule. So I would say that's probably not. So that's like a schedule of like this thing is gonna happen then. Um, so I guess you're saying it, it's like. Uh, a forecast of what's going to happen in some sense. I'll take that one. Schedule. All right. We're going to get two more from someone. Yeah. Yep. So uh, sort of event tra event logs. I'll say like this thing happened, this thing happened, this thing. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Transactions of an individual with a website. Okay. Showing the development of a business, like. Like what? Okay, sales basically. Okay. So what would be the uh, the time series? Like, what's an example of a sale? Like. Uh, we can say uh, maybe like sales per day or sales per month. Yeah, like a cash register. So like. Can be a grocery store. I was thinking about a grocery store. Okay. Yeah. Or you can take a particular item that's like this thing that how many things that we sold for like. More like a rate. So I'm, I'm yeah, I guess so if you said like on this day, this many TBAs are sold. On this day, this many TBAs are sold. That'd be a time series. Alright, I'm gonna go off to the things that I was thinking about, which is along these same lines. So it's sort of like uh, stock market pricing, um, number of cars on the road every year. That's a time series, right? If you have like, remember the bowling example that we had? So number of people at a conference. Self-driving cars, this is all about time series because you're just going to have an observation, 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 observation. It's a sequence of events that are streaming into the car's LiDAR sensors. And it's car's car is supposed to make sense of what those that sequence of events is, right? If you're just looking at a snapshot of the real world, that's like an instant in time. But if you're looking at the streaming data coming in and you're trying to make sense of, oh, the car's moving really fast, you need to have a time series data for that. Uh, well, I was thinking more lines of like, in this year, there were this many people attending. At this year, there were this many people attending, right? So every timestamp and observation, that's that pairing of data, basically. Right. Okay, so the important thing here is that the order matters, right? Usually the, the time stamp and the observation is sort of sequentially ordered. Those are handy. Um, that's unlike the example where you're picking a card from a deck, right? It doesn't matter when that observation was made. The sequence might matter, but the timing usually doesn't matter. Um, and the way that you can figure out does the order matter is by looking at when you re randomly rearrange the, the sequence of the data that you have. If that random shuffling of the data changes the outcome of the analysis you did, then you can figure out, oh, the, the, the order matters. And, and that comes into play when you're looking at how do I interpolate data? Can I interpolate data to fill in missing values? 
if the order doesn't matter versus the order does matter, that changes how you how you fix your data. Okay, so we're gonna give a quick example of a fancy way of determining whether your uh, data order matters, and that's called a, la a lag plot. So a lag plot is a really simple idea. It says what's the difference between uh, one observation and the next observation, and then it does that for all the observations. So it's just looking at the adjacent differences in your data. It's a simple, straightforward concept, but it's sort of like surprising as to how powerful that idea is. It answers all of these questions of like, does the order matter? Um, and what's going on? Is there some structure latent in your data? So first off, if we just have some time that's moving forward, this is like getting into the future, and we have some set of observations and maybe the value of that observation is being recorded. This is just a linear sequence. No big surprise, when you took at the difference between those adjacent values, it's just a line. So like, there's not much information to be learned here. Right? But we could say, well, what happens if we have randomly ordered data? So like here, the reason this was uh, a line is because every difference between the adjacent values was the same. And so we can look at what is the difference between every adjacent value. There is uh, the order matters, it turns out here, even though it's, it's sort of like a simple concept. But we're going to come back. Hopefully, this is establishing some sort of baseline so that when we look at messier data, you can say what was happening. So for instance, this is messier data. So here I have uh, an oscillating curve, but the data within it, it has a bunch of noise. Right? And so you can say this is, this is somewhat messy. It's not a nice, clean wave. Right? And there's a bunch of noise in there. So does the order matter for this? And what's really cool is when you look at the difference between every adjacent point in this curve, so you use, call this lag plot function, and it looks like this. And you're just like, that is not expected. That is really weird. <laughs> Everybody's got, like, they're, they're like, what is going on there? Right? And it's weird, because it's just the same, the same uh, differencing that we're doing up here, just looking at a different differences between adjacent values. Um, but it turns out that because there's order, then this plot is not um, sort of spread out in a uniform sort of blob. All right, so let's look at another uh, set of data. So this is a Gaussian distribution. So there's like randomly picked points from a set of values. And this data, the order doesn't matter. All right, so now let's look at the the difference between every adjacent pair. Uh, sorry, this is, we're just going to validate that this is actually a Gaussian distribution. And really, the lag plot, the lag plot is just like this huge blob of scatter of points, which indicates that there is that the order of the points from the Gaussian distribution doesn't matter. So this is this is like the the very clear takeaway is that when you see something that looks like this, where there's like some structure going on there, right? It means that there's order in your data. But if you see this, some smattering of data points, it means that the data that you're looking at, the order does not matter. Okay. So then we crank up the number of points in our distribution. So like, let's make it really a, a lot of points being selected. It, it gets a nice smooth distribution curve and still, the order doesn't matter. Right? It's just more points in our, our randomly selected blob. Yes. Yeah. It's the same shape blob. Yep. Then, well, not necessarily time series, but at least the order matters. So. You could say the time series is a subset of all the things that can be ordered. So there are other data sets that are not time series that are ordered. OK, so that's just a quick takeaway. The lag plot's pretty handy. It, it, it enables you to differentiate whether the order matters or not. OK, and then let's see. All right, now that we know how to identify timestamp data, we can ask, why does it matter? Like, do we? All right, so all of the cool things that happen in data science, I would almost claim, like, it's because of time series data. Like, figuring out 
what is the outlier, making predictions, um, you know, pattern recognition, all these things are about time series data. Like all the fancy stuff that is going on the cutting edge of data science is time series analysis. That's my claim. All right, so we will get into this specific data set later in the class, but you know, going back to the power analysis that you did already, like that was a time series data, right? And so like, why do we care? Well, if you're planning to build an electrical substation that costs millions of dollars, it's kind of nice to understand whether that investment will be worth it, right? Do you need that capability and capacity? So load planning, so resource planning. Everyone is gonna pay you money as a data scientist to figure out what their business should do. And that's forward looking based on historical data, that's a time series. Weather, right? Everybody likes to know natural events, like what are the hurricanes or typhoons or catastrophes coming? Like even earthquake analysis, right? Like at some point, like this is all time series analysis to figure out what is going to happen to the future. And like if you wanna get into clim climate science, also a time series data analysis. All the cool things, like when you speak to your phone, that's a sequence of sounds that are being emanated into your phone, recorded and then translated into text so that you can search for cats on the internet. That's amazing, right? I mean like, but that was time series analysis that was being done. All right, so now that we sort of have some motive for why we're doing this, um, the next point is like, what is it that you will need for a skill set in order to do any of those things? And so again, this is a very generic overview of any of these things will be applicable to all the aspects that I just showed you. So figuring out like, what are trends going on in the data? What's the periodicity? Is there some frequency that's happening over and over? Um, what are the anomalies and averages? All these good things that, um, and all of these right here, these are just single variables. So like, is there a trend in this data with one sort of sensor? But typically the real world is much, much worse. You have many, many sensors and they may or may not be correlated, and they may be recording at the same time, and so then you have to figure out, well, this one's behaving this way, and this other sensor is behaving in a different way. Do those have any relation between them, right? And if yes, then can I leverage the fact that these are related variables? So I'm probably gonna mostly stick to single variable analysis in time series data, but where the money is at is in multivariate analysis. It gets way worse. All right. So now that I've told you that it's gonna be bad for, for like really complicated data, I'm gonna tell you how bad it's just for one set of data, right? So like one variable, it is a mess. And I'm gonna tell you why it's a mess and then how to clean up the mess. Because all, all data is messy, right? All right, so, so let's say that I have a, a, you know, a timestamp and a single set of observations. How bad could it be? Well, it could be pretty bad, right? Because like clocks are unreliable People are bad at recording data into a, and into a time series. And then there's all these different aspects. And then like, oh, maybe you're familiar with like, you've seen things where you're not clear, is this the month or the day, right? And then like, what, what is the sequence between the year, month, day, like that all matters, obviously, right? If you're trying to understand what's in your data. And then not all uh, people record things on a daily basis. Maybe they do it hourly or like by the minute. And then that really can mess up your, your analysis. And that's because every single person who's ever recorded data has a different expectation about how they will use that data in the future or uh, how, how much money they wanna invest in recording it, right? Recording something at a high frequency costs more than recording something like once a year. And so there's a choice of how much investment am I making in my recording of the data? All right. And then there's gonna be all the problems that you will, so all those assumptions get imposed on you as constraints on how you're gonna be able to use the data. And then there's sort of like little minor details about clocks, right? So like we are here in Eastern, I think daylight savings time, is that correct? I don't know what's daylight savings time. Anyways, so we're in a time zone, right? There's 24 time zones, that's a lie. Get back to that. All right. So basically we're gonna think of when we're looking at the data, everything is either a slice of time or an instant in time. Those are basically your two choices when you're looking at a pandas data frame of time series data. All right, but <laughs> it gets messier, right? So what if um, your, your start times on the bin are only one value, right? So like let's say I have, 
uh, weather weather events, right? So like typically, if you look at a historical weather log, you'll be like, Monday it was 73, Tuesday it was 84, uh, Wednesday it was you know 73. Like, but when was it that temperature? Right? Was that the, at midnight, the high temperature, the low temperature? Right? So hopefully someone conveys that information to you about the data, um, but it's not always clear. All right, so I'm going to pull up a, a, a bit of a mess in a data analysis, and we'll walk through, uh, what was the name? Temporal families. All right, so I was, I was given a task of here's 6,000 CSVs. Can you tell me if the timestamps are valid? So I'm only going to show you three of those CSVs because there's a pattern that emerges pretty quickly. All right, um, and this is from data set where I've, I've removed all of the sensitive data. So all you get to see basically is the timestamps. That'll be enough to cause a problem. All right, so it's uh, ECG data, and I'm going to look at one of the CSVs. There's only five columns here because I've removed all the things that I don't want to show you. But the five columns are basically the, the time. And they've done a very nice thing here for us. Every row contains a start time and an end time in seconds. And so the next bin, the next row here, is the next time slice start and end. And you'll notice there's a pattern here, right? The end of this time slice is the beginning of this time slice. So they were super explicit about what exactly they're looking at. So this is like a, a chunk of time with clear start and end time. And, right? So that's, that sounds like a really good thing. They're super clear about what they're doing. All right, so there's some sanity checks. I happen to know from this data set that the during or closest to should either be a zero or one, and there should only be one. So let's look at that. So yeah, there's 93 rows. Um, I did a quick sanity check. There's also 93 rows, and therefore there should be 93 begin times and 93 end times. And so we can check that with n unique. So that's good. So the data set passes the, the sanity check. The next thing to check is, is the time ordered uh, sort of tonically? Is everything later than the previous data? And the answer here, just by a quick visual inspection, yes. And so often it, it's really convenient, and you've already done this in homework, analyzing time series data visually makes the anomalies stand out really well. And your, your eye is very good at picking out patterns. Rely on that part. OK, so this is basically just us validating that every increasing row has a later time. That's what this shows us. OK. Uh, this is convert. So our time is in seconds. So we have to convert from seconds to minutes to hours, because there's about seven hours worth of data. Good question. OK, so this is where the, the tricky part begins. So if I look at the difference between the start and end times, so here, at the beginning here, I had a begin and end time. And so I ask, what is, how long is that time slice? What is the duration? So if I look at that duration, it's just a difference for each row between the end and begin. And then that's a new column. And so then if I plot that difference, I see something weird going on, right? So almost everything is five minutes, except for one bin, which is uh, slightly less than five minutes. And again, super easy to pick out visually. That would have been really hard to check out um, through uh, 6,000 sets of data. All right, so I changed this into minutes. That was the divide there. So now we say, OK, we found an outlier. What's going on? So like nothing sort of like obvious from just looking at one row. So if we look at the adjacent rows, then we can say, oh, well, the adjacent rows were 300 seconds. And this one was 280 seconds. So something was going on there. That's weird. The other sort of like thing to be really cautious about, remember the, the bins were supposed to be adjacent to each other. And we can visually check that here. Like this one started at 9,420 seconds, and this one ended 300 seconds later. And then the next one started at that same time, and then it ended 280 seconds later. And then this one started at the same time. Right? So they, they were contiguous. Does that make sense? OK, so that's good. So we've got contiguous bins, even though one of them is slightly shorter than all the other ones. 
So now we want to ask a really hard question, which is, were there were all the bins contiguous? Right, so we have to we have to sort of check that were there any gaps between any adjacent slices of time. So a, a lazy way of checking that, the better way of checking it, is I want to ask. I noticed there was a pattern here when I was doing this sort of adjacent sets of time that there's a ten thousand on the end and there's a ten thousand at the beginning. So these two sets of columns should have pairs of values, right? If they weren't paired up, that's likely that there was a a gap uh, missing. And so just in this little analysis, you can see that there were two instances of 9720 and the two instances of 10,000. And so this pattern will repeat uh, through the entire data set that there's two uh, entries of all the values. And so then I can pick out um, using set operations, what's the total set of all the values? And then what are the ones that only exist in one of the columns, and then I can figure out uh, if if there are time values that only exist in one of the columns, which are the uh, single values. And it turns out that they're this 26,200 and negative 1860. So where did that come from? Those are like the unpaired entries. That was the first one and the last one. So those didn't have pairs. That's what you'd expect. So we had a hypothesis that all of them were paired up, and we found that to be true, except for the ones that was the very starting and the very ending. So now we have some confidence that there were no gaps in our data. All right, so we've built up a set of tests. Now let's go apply this to another CSV out of our 6,000. Just randomly selected another random CSV, same analysis. Huh, another one with an outlier. All right, no gaps there. And then a third one, huh, okay, 20 seconds longer than the other ones. All right, at this point, I stop. I say, data science is over, right? I have to go talk to the person who provided me the data, and I have to ask them, what is going on? Everything is normal except for one of the rows, which has one outlier that's either 20 seconds above or 20 seconds below. So I stop my analysis, because as a data scientist, I have to understand what this is, what's causing this. Something with the collection, maybe someone made a mistake, the mistake's unlikely because I just found three randomly selected CSVs out of 6,000 that all have a very similar problem. So the, I guess the takeaway that I want you to, to have here is like you need to stop your analysis and understand what's going on in your data, usually not technical. Right? You have to talk to someone who generated the data or understands the data better than you do. Okay. That was a take. Sorry? <laughs> this one goes off. In, so you'll notice your... Uh, your little pieces of paper are all from a medical school, so it's medical data. I didn't actually go solve the problem. That's where my doctor goes in and solves the problem for me. <laughs> so I'm not the doctor. But yeah, OK. So you've all worked with timestamps already, so you have some idea of uh, <laughs> what they look like. So I'm going to ask you to do another activity on the other side of the paper. What time is it? That's the question. <laughs> All right. Someone showed out to me in a very descriptive format what they wrote down. Seven fifty one PM hyphen sixteen nineteen. Like that? Okay. Someone else? How did you spell October? Like spelled out? O C T O then O C T with a comma there or no? Comma, okay. Oh, Wednesday spelled out? No. So Wednesday with no period and a comma, O C T all lowercase. Yep. Then what? With a no comma? Okay. Uh two more. 
Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, you can't see that, but I see it. All right. Well, two more. Spelled out. With that just a space? One more. So, uh, like the same thing here? Did you cop? Okay. <laughs> I'll spell though, Wednesday. 10, 16, 19. And what were your seconds? 33. With no PM or no PM? Okay. All right. So, does anyone notice something here? What what would be a, a takeaway from this sort of like set of values? <laughs> They're all different, right? <laughs> like like every I I would be awfully shocked. Like we, we I don't want to go through all of you, but I would be sh if if two people had the same sort of description of the data, right? Like uh, it's not a competition, but I I just think that every single person here is going to have a different representation of the same exact time. Okay, it's break time, so I'll leave you with that. And let's come back at 8 p.m.
As I've mentioned with the exercise, which I erased already, so you had a lot of options and, and you're bringing in your experience about what the right thing to do is. 
There are a couple other things to think about about why people make different choices. They may be constrained by the devices that they're measuring from. So if your time uh, sensor doesn't have seconds, then you won't be able to put that, or you shouldn't put that in your data. Right? And then the other trade-off is compactness. So often people have very limited space, or they just don't need to use up all the space, even if they have the accuracy present in their sensors. And so this becomes another trade-off of, I'm going to have millions of entries with timestamps. And so if those take up more space than they should, I'm going to have less space for the actual data. So that's another trade-off choice that people typically make with time series data. Now, what most people don't think about is the fact that um, their sensor is measuring in a specific location that has a time zone, right? And that time zone may or may not be recorded in the timestamp. And that gets to be its own little special mess, which we'll talk about next. So, you know, if, if something doesn't have a timestamp, it's up to you and your human skills to figure out was this a uh, universal coordinated time or was it the local timestamp, right? Those are like your two primary guesses. And that sort of relies on the information of where was the information gathered from. Like if you know it was gathered in California versus in Germany, that might give you some evidence about whether or not you think that your data has a specific timestamp. All right, so there's a really, uh, and, you know, everybody's been using date time already, so I won't belabor that point, but um, string time, let's call that up. All right, so this is basically how all of our timestamps in Python are going, be, are going to be encoded. This is intended to capture all the different varieties of, like, do you spell out the month as three letters, or do you spell it out as, like, a full word, right? All those choices are encapsulated in this uh, set of options in this, in this module. So this is how you will have to do detective work to figure out what format of these options you're using. No one here called out military time. Does anyone here not know about military time? Okay, so right now it's 8.04 on that clock. And if you didn't have Windows, which we don't have Windows, you wouldn't know that whether that was referring to 8.04 a.m. or 8.04 p.m. And so there's two ways of dealing with that. One is to explicitly include the a.m. p.m. designation. The other is to use what's called military time. Yeah, 24 o'clock. Yeah. So it's now 20.04. All right. Yeah, so that's on here also. All right. 24 o'clock, that's a good way to go. All right. Now, yeah. All right. So the other assumption that I warned you about was that there are 24 time zones, obviously, because you know we've segmented the Earth into 24 different time zones. That's wrong. Right? <laughs> so as far as I can tell, there's 37 different time zones. <laughs> and you would think, naturally, right? Like they all break on the hour, right? It's either 2 AM or 3 AM or 4 AM. Some of them are offset by half an hour or 15 minutes. That gets crazy. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and then, so the, the standard way of, like, dealing with this is to use universal coordinated time. That's, like, our offset as Eastern time zone depends on whether we're in daylight saving times or not. So UTC is just a single timestamp set in Greenwich, England, I believe. And then we're all different from that by some value. All right, let's see what that looks like in a notebook. All right. So I'm going to use this library called PYTZ, time zone. Obviously, that's easy to remember. OK, so then we can import date time and PYD. And then we can get the time. Let's actually get the current time, so it's more obvious. All right, so that's confusing, right? It says 2019, 10, 17, 6, 39. I don't know what all that stuff is, right? This is probably the, the year. That's probably the month. But it's really not the 17th, right? It's the 16th, right? And so if you look at what date time refers to as the day, it's the 17th. Why is that? Exactly. So UTC is our time plus four hours uh, during the summer. So we can be explicit about what time zone we're in. And so if we say as a time zone, then we can make it explicit that it is, in fact, UTC. So that, that clears up the confusion about what is Python grabbing. It's grabbing UTC time. The handy thing with PYTZ is that you can convert that 
into a specific time zone. So we know that we're in the US Eastern time zone. So we can tell they time that, and then it will do the conversion for us that the local time is, uh, let's reset that. Yeah, thanks. There we go. So the actual local time, it thinks, is 20, yeah, 07, yep. Okay. So this is a way of specifying which time zone you're in the date time so that it refers to the local time rather than UTC. Simple trick. Once you know it exists. All right. I think that's this seconds or this. I always like exploring things live here. So date today that yeah, seconds. Forty nine. Uh, yeah, so that's, no, <laughs> I don't have an answer on that one. Let's see. Days, hours, seconds, microseconds, probably microseconds, let's try that. Microsecond, there we go. Yes. So, by the way, I was using a tab expansion there in case you noticed what I was doing. So today, I can tab expand, right? Just hit date T and hit, hit tab, and then it expands. And then I use tab after dot to see what are my options. Yeah, so that's the same. So earlier in the semester, I used the command dir, I think that. Yeah, so that, that also reveals the same set of values there. So, so I can either use dir to see what the contents of that module are. Or I can use tab expansion if that's available in your notebook. Same thing. OK. All right, so now <laughs> I've armed you, right? You're armed and dangerous. You know how to deal with time zones. Whoop, whoop. That was easy, right? It was just like a library. All right. Let's see. So the, the fun thing is that um, <laughs> we here in the US switch our time zone offset every six months, which is super annoying for data scientists. Right? Imagine that you're looking at many years of data that is like at minute level increments. Right? Every six months, it's going to offset an hour, and you're just like, oh my god. Right? All right. Hopefully, you don't have to deal with that too often. So the other warning to think about in terms of um, this being an issue is that if you think that your UTC offset indicates where you are, it's probably wrong. So if you try and reverse engineer that, like you're in one place that is in a time zone, but if that time zone is changing every six months, you can't actually reverse engineer where you are based on your time zone. OK, a little heads up. All right, so there's all these problems, right? And so computer scientists don't have time to worry about all this different stuff to worry about. And so they came up with a different problem. <laughs> OK, tell me this is like, this is how scientists solve problems by inventing new ones, right? So what we decided as computer scientists is that we're going to say that January 1st, 1970 in UTC is the be all end all timestamp. Like once you start there, start your, your second stopwatch and that number of seconds since then, that's what time it is. <laughs> okay, so, so how many seconds has elapsed since January 1st of 1970 in UTC? That's the question. And the answer to that question is the epoch time. So how many seconds since that date? OK, so this was a really arbitrary choice in some sense, right? Other people have made other choices, so they have other epoch times. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. So, so now this thing, <laughs> and Microsoft sets it since like 1600, January 1st, right? Yeah, like. Weird, weird choices, right? So like, so there's this weird choice of like, the concept of an epoch of like number of seconds since a given point in time, that's a thing. But what is your starting epoch time? That's the hard part. <laughs> All right. We have conversations. What are the, what are the questions? <laughs> Do we have a question? April. Yes. So she asked. What was the? Ah. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. 
So who else here had a question about time zones? Perfect, right? So like one person had a question, four people had a question. The same question. All right, so when you have a question, raise your hand. Let's look at time zones. Mm, images, yeah, there we go. Well, so I'm going to be US centric and just pick on that one first. So <laughs> if you're familiar with the United States, there are different states. And you would think, naturally, right, like time zone boundaries break on state boundaries. False. All right. <laughs> so this is where, like, little towns in, like, Kansas and Kentucky, they get to choose which side of the time zones they're on for whatever convenience they have. All right, questions about this map? I'm gonna pull up a world map next. <laughs> All right, you think this is bad, it gets way worse, right? I'm gonna make that bigger, probably not. Yeah, it's too slow. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I'm gonna make it bigger, one big one. All right, well, anyways, so China made the brilliant choice that the entire country is in one time zone, right? No need to worry about anything because everybody's in the same time zone. But the United States, we're divided up. Africa, most countries are in one time zone or the other. Russia, there's like 12 time zones. <laughs> it's really crazy. All right, it's a big, long country. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I think that's just the wrapping around. They only chose like four colors. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's <just> a bad <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll pick on much noisier one and see if it makes you happier. <laughs> well, this one's just as bad. Mm, kind of. Anyways. There we go. That's more explicit. So they're just using like three colors. <laughs> Anyways. The other thing to think about in terms of timelines is the international date line. So you can't just linearly increase 24 hours and keep going around. Like you have to have some break where you skip over an entire day. So the fun like travel exploit here is like if you like Christmas or any other holiday or New Year's, you can crisscross the international date line a few times and have as many New Year's as you want. <laughs> My dad went through this. He like he celebrated Christmas three times one day. All right, now we're now now we're happy with dateline or timeline or time zones. Yeah. Right. Come back here. How long is that? All right. So again, just as you convert it with timestamps, you can convert the epoch time, um, and you can convert it the output as to what other format you want to get you know the thing that you're looking for. So it, it can it can be used in terms of both the input conversion and output conversion. You just have to know what the two things you're aiming for are. Okay. Any other questions on epoch time? Because like that's probably what you'll see a lot. The the like either it's gonna look something like year, month, day, hour, minute, second, that's the most common, or it's gonna be epoch based and it's the number of seconds since some start time. Those are your two primary choices. All right, so how do we visualize this? All right, so I needed some time series data, so I made it. And the way that I made it, and this might be of interest to you if you care about these sorts of things, my computer has a time stamp on it, right? So there's a little clock that's running. And I have a bunch of things that are being measured on my computer. So how much CPU, how much memory, how much disk, how many different files are accessed, blah, 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 all those different things. Those are time series, because I can plot each one of those observations versus time. Right. So let's look at what my computer produced for me in terms of time stamp data. What I call it the plotting time series data. Uh, did I not call it that? Plotting time series data. All right. <laughs> so this is like a, a weird bend thing. So I needed, well, I'll, I'll walk through this notebook and I'll tell you the weird thing. So we'll rerun everything. So basically, I recorded a bunch of metrics off of my computer, and I stored them in this uh, data frame and stored the data frame as a pickle. Pickle file is like an um, in-memory object that you've written to the disk. So I've now stored that data, and I can read it back into my computer. All right, so that's that with open. 
the pickle contains, it's a list of size four, and so the, the four things are there sort of like metadata about my data frame. So things like, what was the, the name of the um, notebook that I was running on? What was the, um, the process ID and all this other stuff? The important thing I'm gonna pick out for you guys is the data frame. So there's the data frame and the information about the data frame. That's my, my dictionary there. Okay, so the data frame is not very big. It's 600 by 328 columns. Let's see, is that right? Yeah. So there were specifically 328 different things I was measuring about my computer at a given time, which is a lot, right? That seems like a lot. So CPU times, virtual memory, all these different things are being measured. And whoop, I don't know, I'm gonna go scroll. No, scroll on, there we go. All right, so I was recording the time in Unix seconds. So that's the time since 1970, January 1st, UTC, in seconds elapsed. So that's like a big number. Okay, so that's basically the, the preview of the data. Let's plot it. So I'm just gonna look at my CPU utilization over time. Right, that seems like a relatively straightforward thing to do. So the naive thing to do is just plot my x-axis is the rows and one of the columns, which is CPU one time. And this looks reasonable in terms of like CPU utilization should be between zero and 100. But then like these don't quite make sense. Why is it going from zero to 600? Those turn out by default when you use the plot function for matplotlib, it's just the rows. So that wasn't quite what we intended. It's plotting one column and by default, it's using the row indices. Okay, so that's not quite what we wanted. Also, the line plot can be sort of mean, so I'm gonna convert it into a scatter plot, which is fine, but the scatter plot um, requires two inputs. So I have to specify what the, the index is gonna be. So I can say, from this column, the x value is gonna be the index for that column, and the y value is gonna be the values in that column. So I'm just treating a series as the column of data. Okay, so that's a scatter plot. It looks a little bit different, uh, but it's the same data set. Okay, so now I'm gonna look for the word seconds. And as I sort of previewed over here, one of my 328 columns has the word seconds in it. So that's probably my timestamp. So I did that by just searching through all the different column names for the word seconds. So that shows up once. So that's, those are my timestamps. Okay, and we can see for comparison, what time is it now? Time.time .time says it's some large number of seconds. So that's, that's cool. Now if we plot what that looks like, uh, so we're gonna use, rather than the column values and the column index, now we're gonna use the column values from the CPU times and the column values from time in unit seconds. So those will be our X and Y coordinates. So now we're moving slightly, something more realistic. This is epoch seconds. So it's the same time scale with the same data, but now it really is time, not the index value. But from some practical purpose, this is also meaningless, right? 1500 to 2200, I can't tell what time that is, right? I can't speak epoch time. So obviously there's another step. Wheel. So it would be useful to convert all of our epoch times into a date time object, right? Because they, this plot, wasn't very useful, although it had time as the x-axis, we really wanted something that was human readable. So I can convert each of the epoch times into a timestamp. That's what that new column is gonna be called, so it's called date time. That column just contains all the date time ent entries. All right, so now we have um, two things that we have times with, date times. All right, so now if we look at just those two columns, this looks more useful. So if we wanna um, compare, those are the same views. Let's plot that. So now we have something that looks reasonably human readable. So we have a, a date and a time and a date and a time and a date and time. So this is good. Now we've got readable data. And we can make it even prettier by rotating things and make it a little bit, I think, easier to read. So this is basically what you did for your homework with lining up all the dates and times. 
Okay, and then the last thing that I will do for this data set is I'll switch the index being from zero through, what was it, 600. That's not really a useful index. So we're gonna switch, we're gonna set the date time to be the index. As anyone here has seen this in their data before of changing integers for your index to something other than integers for your index. Okay, so this is new, good. So it's usually useful when analyzing a data frame with time series data to have non, so, so using the actual timestamp for the index rather than an integer. That's, that's what this data frame is now. So remember up at the top, what we had was basically the row value. So like this is row zero, row one, row two, row three. And one of those columns I had was the actual time in epoch seconds. But what I really would be helpful to have is we can reset that index and then that is very clear about this row represents that time. This row represents that time. That makes your analysis usually pretty easy. Yeah, so questions? Yeah, so basically I had the data frame index was a set of integers, and I reset that to an existing column. Yeah, so I think that, yeah, so that column disappears because I, I did have it, uh, well, I did have it as a data frame column, now I'm just resetting it to be the index. Okay. Good. All right. So this is like a pretty straightforward tactic to apply with time series data. So the, now the, the fun thing. So where is this data coming from? This is just like a little side note. So I wanted to understand how much computer resources my notebook was using. Right? When I execute my notebook, I know it's using some memory. It's using some... Uh, disk and some network and some CPU. And so I wrote a notebook that inspects all of those values for the notebook that I'm running. So that's where this data is coming from. The value there is like in the future, someone's going to say, how much computer resources do I need to run your notebook? And you'll be able to say, here's a notebook that analyzes how much resources another notebook is using. <laughs> Does this make sense? So you will be able to take these notebooks, and let's say you've written some analytic, and you want to really instrument how much resources it takes. In another sort of window, you'll run the notebook that measures the notebook, and you'll run the notebook that is actually doing the thing, and then you'll be able to produce reports like this to say how much CPU it used versus time. All right. <laughs> Sorry? You can plot indexes. That's what this first one is. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so so here, so just to start over, when you use the matplotlib plot function and you pass it in a column, that column is actually a pandas series, right? It has an index value and a, a data entry. And so matplotlib recognizes that and it plots the index versus the, the value. So all of the work that I did in the rest of the notebook was to show how to not do that. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. So <laughs> eventually when you leave here, this is the goal of this notebook is when you leave here, someone's going to say, is your laptop enough to do your work? And you'll have to be able to answer them. Yes, it is because I never use anything larger or it's, it is for now, but in the future I'll need something more or it's not even useful now. I have to use a bigger computer. So that's where this, this notebook is going. All right, now we're going to do a little bit of a digression. So we're going to switch to a different topic. That's preparation for the second to last topic. So we're going to come back to uh, time series data, but first we have to do a little bit of catch up because I don't know that everyone is in 602. So who here is in 602? Okay, so a little more than half the class, I'd say. Thank you. Okay, so this is my little mental map of all the machine learning topics that you might encounter uh, in the near term. So supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. Uh, it's basically, do your, uh, is, your data, is your data labeled or not? And there's different things you can do. And so we're gonna focus on linear regression, which is predicting some value, right? It's, it's 
we won't cover much machine learning in this class, but that's the, the point of where we are in machine learning. Okay. So now I'm going to use a marker. And I need someone who is not in 602 currently. Okay. Michael, can you come down? So a quick disclaimer, have you done machine learning before? No. Okay, so we have an unsuspecting victim or a volunteer. Can you take the marker and draw a line that best fits all of those points? Do I need to fill these points? Fit those points, yeah, with a straight line. Will I be joining or like? Yeah, best fit. No, no, no. <laughs> One straight line. So one straight line. <laughs> so I wouldn't call this a straight line. It's a curved line. Okay. We're going to give you one more chance. Okay. One more. I have faith in you. All right. One straight line. And it doesn't have to be perfect, right? It can be close. Okay, so my question to you is, how did you arrive at that being uh, a best fit for these data points? Just visualization. Okay, so you're using your intuition, and I would claim that normally you're trying to minimize the distance between the line that you draw and the points that you're going through. Is that right? So you're trying to minimize the distance between this one line and all of the points on the data set. Yeah. Is that valid? Okay, thank you. All right, so we had a non-machine learning person come up and demonstrate that he has the intuition on how to fit a, a, a line to some data. That's all trend analysis in some sense is. All right, so he did something like this where he drew a straight line through a set of data points, and his goal was to minimize the distance between that line and all of the points. This is the essential idea of linear regression. There's a bunch of different options. This one, the naive version is called Deming regression. That's probably what he did. Um, but there's uh, different options. So basically, um, when you're doing linear regression, you're either trying to minimize the distance in this direction or this direction or orthogonally to both. Right? So that, that's sort of like the, the choices. And so what you're trying to minimize depends on what it is you're trying to predict. And that distance between your points and your line is called the residual. That's the thing you're trying to minimize. All right. And normally, um, <laughs> the mathematical operations by which you're trying to minimize this is pretty straightforward. You're just squaring the distance from the line. Uh, but sometimes it's worse, right? So like, if the variance of the data changes over the range of data you're looking at, then the way in which you fit the data also, it should be different. Heteroscedastic is that word. Um, and so there's other, other different sort of like fitting techniques. For your purposes, it doesn't matter. The whole point is you're trying to minimize the distance between your data and the line that you're fitting in order to predict new data. OK, so there's this funny XKCD comic. If you haven't heard of XKCD, it's an online web comic. Basically, they go through all the different ways of fitting data, which are incorrect. Okay, so I'm going to go into a specific example, because I'm a physics person, about fitting data with physics. So typically, the reason that you're looking at a linear regression is for two purposes. One is to fit your data and describe the model from which uh, the data is fitting, or the other is to predict data you haven't seen. So those are the, the two sort of observations of why we would make a, a linear regression. So the physics example that I was alluding to is when I taught physics, I would have students run a ramp, run a ball down a ramp with a little kick at the end of it. And then the ball would go down the ramp, gaining more and more speed, and then be off the ramp, and then land somewhere else, you know, usually somewhere like out the window or something, right? And so the task that I was giving my students was, can you take, so record some data points of where your ball was, and then fit those set of data points? That's a relatively straightforward task of recording the data. It takes about two hours. 
and then <laughs> fitting it with a line. And so some students would um, do this, right? So the ramp ends, you can sort of picture the ball rolling down, and then like it goes off in this direction. And so they would fit that line, and it looks pretty good, right? They've got uh, the 10 data points are required for this experiment, and they fit it with a line, and they're done. Look at that correlation coefficient of 0.99. That means you're really, uh, the line fits the data really well. Does anyone here recognize a problem? Yes, yes. Well, if it doesn't make it off the ramp? Yes. Well, it, the ball, let's see. Let me draw a picture of the ramp so you sort of picture what that looks like. So the, the height from which you release the ball is very high. And so as long as you release it higher than with this lip, it'll always have a lot of momentum to, to kick off there. So yes, April. Yeah, yeah, distance. distance from the point yes. Distance. Yes. So the, the problem here is balls do not go off ramps and they just keep going in straight lines. That's the problem, right? It's always a parabolic trajectory. All right, so the issue is they were sampling from just a very small region, which looked linear, but in fact it wasn't. Right? So the, the takeaway lesson here was um, have a good understanding of the range of acceptable values for your data before trying to fit the curve. So having a good idea of the range is the answer there. So if you simply record data points and say, well, I recorded them, and I know those observations are correct, so the data must be correct. Right? That didn't work out because you didn't have a good concept of what range of values were acceptable. Okay, so all of this is basically um, setting us up. That was all a concept, basically, for... The fact that you can use linear regression to find trends in your data, but it doesn't mean trends that you find are correct. That was the sort of where I was going with that. All right, now we're set up. Now I've got all the essential facts for how to decompose a time series into its parts. Okay, so to get us started, I'm going to give you the data to do the analysis on. I'm pretty lazy, right? I don't actually want to teach you guys. I just want to give you the data. So in Blackboard. Uh, we'll come up with some randomly assigned partners. And then, so while we're waiting for the partners, log into Blackboard and download the Texas Power Data. Okay, so pull that up on your computer. I'll get the, uh, the pairs. It should be in Blackboard if you don't, yeah, under week eight. Yeah. Mm, all right. I'm just going to wait for it, so I'll put it up there. Actually. So once you've got your partner, the person with the longer arm is the one typing today. The longer arm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So if you plot the data, the question is, is it totally random or is it like, is there some sort of pattern to it? Is it, you know, on the period of days or months, is there any pattern to it? Yeah, that's the problem, right? So like you can choose any of these and see if there's any temporal patterns at all. I would suggest just plotting the time data. Just see if there's any. So if, if you plot the data and just see if there's any patterns in, well, pick one column, right, and then see if there's anything there. You can pick another column, see if there's anything there. Like just explore the data, basically. So make a plot of the data. So is that the... I do not understand that. So uh, can we scroll up? What does your data frame look like? Yeah, it's have data here. All right. And we are, what are you plotting up here? I'm plotting for our hand. Mm, so how do we decide this is a temporal, uh, like for temporal pattern? Right. So, I'd, yeah. So, so you have two columns. So if you scroll down a little bit, you have a time, and you have a measurement. And so if you plot this one versus that one, that would be the actual data versus time. Or you could plot this one versus east, or this one versus west. Right. So like, time versus an observation that'll give you some measurements. And then the challenge plot at once. Yeah, that's not probably. <laughs> there's something going on. Okay, that looks reasonable, right? So there's something, there's some periodicity there, but it's hard to see what it is because you don't know what those measurements are. 
How are you guys doing? So basically, we can just plot anything and check all of those data frames. So if you have uh, times and you have some observations, okay. then you want to measure or plot okay. those two columns against each other to so see what. Basically, one with the R and then the X row. Yeah. Okay, take about two more minutes, and we'll cut it out and do a little bit of a break. So, so you have a bunch of spikes there, right? Yeah. Do you know how to convert this lower axis into something that would make more sense? Okay. Yeah. So, like, there's some spikes there, but you don't know if this is like every month or every day or anything, right? So, like, the challenge is you have to figure out how to convert that lower axis into something that is more understandable, right? So you can pick out the pattern. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're on break. You can keep working over break, or you can use the bathroom and get a drink and go outside. Your choice. We're on break. Yes. This seems to be one temporal pattern, right? Because one, everything is in some. Uh, and, and these are by year. Yeah, these okay. are by year, and nice. these are by this value. Okay. Good. Cost. Yeah. yeah. This seems to be one temporal pattern. There's some outlier yeah. there. Yeah. So we need to find that. You could, yeah. 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 I mean, it's not a requirement. It's you know, okay. this is just data to explore. Okay. But yeah, so the other one is the lag plot that's down there. But anyways, all right. Everyone here is aware you are on break, yes? Okay, okay. Just making sure. Because <laughs> everyone's working, I'm just thinking this is the break. <laughs>
Yes. So is it okay if I ask now or should I mail you? Uh, you uh, can we do it after class? Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, plotted lag one, like lag plot. Yeah, yeah. Good. And how do I decide it is time series or data random? So, well, <laughs> here you're you're just doing a lag plot of the hours. Yeah. So it should be very. Uh, the, the order matters. So let's let's compare that to another column. Okay. Make a leg plot for like coast. Right. So it's a little bit more spread out. The, basically, the point here is the order matters, and it's nice and uh, linear like that. If it were a big spread out blob, then you could say that order does not matter. But I mean, like looking so at the hours, the order. This is the time series. Yes, that is the statement. Yep. Yep. Uh, actually, the, <laughs> that is in the sample power and dice rolling notebooks on Blackboard. Yeah. And I tried to use what you did there, and okay. I did not get it to work for the blank. All right. So since we're on, coming back from break, we can do it after class or elsewhere. But okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's come back to our desk. Okay, so 
<laughs> you've now been working with a couple of different time series data sets. Uh, this is a, another example of that. And the, I'm going to tell you basically the four, four ways of thinking about this data. So what you have here is raw data. So this is, I think, a number of airline passengers over many years. And you can see there's some patterns going on there. Right? OK. So the nice thing about uh, these data sets is that there is some sort of like periodicity going on, and there's a trend going on that's sort of like going upward, right? The number of passengers is increasing month over month. So when we do time series decomposition, the thing that we have to worry about is um, what type of data, uh, what, what the behavior of the data is. So like if we see something like this, that's something to account for. It means it's not stationary. It's not flat. So that, that, that one is pretty easy to deal with. There's a line here that would trace that out. And the, and the math trick is, if you figure out what the trend is for that slope, you can detrend the data. You can make it flat. And that flatness means you can now apply other mathematical techniques to it. So this first one is pretty straightforward to deal with. These other two, not so much. Hmm? So like with this plot right here, the average value, I can draw a line through it. Yeah, so far so good. And so once you know that, then you can basically rotate all those data points so that the data points are now just a, a, a sine curve that's uh, just oscillating around a flat mean value. You've detrended the data. Right, so the benefit is now you can do other mathematical analysis because you've removed the trend. So there's follow-on techniques that we're going to do. OK, a couple of conversations. Uh, not before removing the trend. You have to make it flat. Other questions? <laughs> we'll come back to that. OK. OK. So remember when we were doing linear regression and we draw a line through a set of points? That line may not be flat, right? It may have some slope to it. And so with this data example, that line, the average value here is not flat. Correct? Do you agree with that? <laughs> OK, so there is a linear regression that would pass through that that it sort of like looks like this. Right. So it looks like this, sorry. And so before we do other analyses, then we have to remove that slope from the data. We have to detrend it, and we have to make make the data flat. So we've, we're going to keep those oscillations, but it's no longer going to have a trend that's going upwards. Okay, so that's the goal there. Other data sets you can't do that with. So here, the amount of variation is changing, so that means we can't apply our mathematical te techniques as easily. And here, there's a, it's a called covariance, so the amount of change is changing, that means we can't apply our techniques. So basically, we want to get back to this property called stationarity. So stationary just means that there's flat data, that the variation is not changing. Right, we'll come back to counterexamples of that. All right, so the first step with our actual time series data is to figure out what is the slope of that data. All right, so that's like step number one, identify what the trend is. All right. Once we've done that, if we take this original line and we subtract out that, that slope, the remaining values now look like this. That's very different, isn't it? We've removed all of the, the change that's going up, and now we're just left with the part that's oscillating. That's very handy. It means we can do some analysis on this type of data. And the last part is, now that you recognize that there's this oscillation, you can remove that. So how much of that is oscillation and how much of it is noise? So that last part is called the residual. So this is like the difference. So you have your original data set. You subtract out the trend. You're left with some oscillation, oscillating data. And then you can remove the oscillations, and you're left with the noise. Okay. Yes. Exactly. We will. That's a great question. I will show you, April. So it looks to me like the oscillations that it never changes very much. 
Uh, because you've removed the trend that's going up. Really, that's all you did, and you've got like that perfect oscillation. Yeah. <laughs> mm, so I think you're, you're looking at like how much the peaks change over time. Yeah. What is the pattern in noise? Well, noise means you've removed all the things that you know the patterns for. I don't have a super strong answer to, to answer your point, April. <laughs> I'll have to come back to it. I, I am skeptical, is I think what I'm trying to say. That Understood. The third one is actually the constant. Yeah. OK. So this is basically the goal. We're going to apply this to the Texas power data that you were just looking at. So we're actually going to do this. OK. So again, for whatever reason, I have an easy time finding power data, so we'll just look at that. Uh, let's see. Time series historical power data. Okay. Let's see. I call it power DF analysis. Okay. So first, with this power data, I'm going to show you uh, my approach to solving the in-class task that I gave you. Okay. So I, I load a bunch of data. Let's rerun all of this. Everything's fresh. Okay, so I'm going to rely on a bunch of different tools this time. So you may not have seen these before. Seasonal decompose, that's going to pick out the periodicity from our data. Uh, ACF, that's going to do our lag plot for us. Okay, so I load in the same power data that I gave you. So you have this data already. That's good. And then again, just to verify, this is the data frame that you were playing with. with one of those columns being the timestamp. And then you can see here, yes, we actually do mean timestamp. It's a date time 64 in nanoseconds, so that's good. Everything else is floats or ints. All right, are there any NAN values? Nope, good to go. No cleaning necessary. All right, so we're going to skip over the scatter plot. Uh, sorry, we're going to. So if Basically, this is the first task that I was giving you. So if you use plot date, and you say, I'm going to have a date versus a values, then I can just get uh, this sort of plot. And the cool thing is it picks out the years for you, so it's all done. Like, that's one line there. So the tough part is, like, this is over the span of, what is that, 12 years of data. And so you see these 12 spikes with some noise in them, right? And so you're like, well, OK, there's some patterns going on here. Let's pick out what those patterns are. Since this is Texas power data, we might assume that summer is hotter than winter, and therefore more power is used during the summer. So our first sort of hypothesis to test is, are the summers hotter than the winters Right, using more power? That would make sense. So that might explain these peaks here. So we'll come back to that hypothesis later. So what I usually do when I see data that looks like this, it's very crowded. There's a lot going on. What I'll do is I'll take a little subslice of that data, and I'll say, what does the little subslice tell me? So the way that I do that is I'm going to just say, I know that, uh, let's see, that's hourly data. And so if I want five days worth of data, I need 24 times five data points. And to look at literally the first, I don't even know, what was that 25, 125-ish data points? I can say I want this column of our end from row index 0 through whatever that max value is, like 125-ish. Right, so it's going to plot the first 125 data points from that column. And then for the y values, I'm going to do the east data set. And I'm going to look at the first 125 rows. Okay, So far, so good. We've got just a little data. It's not as crowded as that first plot. OK, so here. We can look at the, again, I'm rotating my x ticks by 60 degrees so I can read a little bit more easy. And now we see that in addition to those yearly oscillations that we could see in the overall view, if we look at just uh, the first few days, we can see that there are also daily oscillations. Right? So from January 1st to the 2nd, that's probably the day to night change. Right? So more power is being used during the day. Not a big surprise there. So far as. And so it's January. Maybe there's some change right from week to week, or 
weekends versus weekdays, right? So there's sort of like a question here of, if I look back at my calendar and ask what day of the week is January 1st, right? Maybe that's a weekend, so it's less power. Also true, holiday, right? Good call. All right, so here we base it out. There are 24 hour cycle patterns. So that's like one thing that's on top of the observation that there are annual patterns. So real world data is gonna have a lot of different overlaying oscillations. You're gonna have annual, weekly, daily, all these different patterns in your data. Okay, so now if I, if I get a little bit larger, again, 24 hours and 30 days, so that's now 24 times 30, that's the number of data points I'm gonna carve off from my data set. Then I can view the week-to-week -week oscillations, right? So this is like, let's see, roughly this is a week, that's another week, right? There's four weeks here. You can sort of see where the weekends end up because there's less power used on the weekends, right? So there's a seven-day oscillation there. All right, so <laughs> that's cool. So now we've got a bunch of data. If we look at an entire year, it sort of bears out that first expectation we had about summers being hot, right? So 24 hours times 365 days, that number of points is what we're going to look at as a subset. And we can see from 2006 to 2007, yep, July, August, September, those were hot. We're in Texas. Texas is a hot state, so we're good to go. So Notice before I've done any of my sort of like fancy analysis, I'm just looking at the data. I'm using visualizations to check my, my intuition because if these don't match my intuition, there's either one of two things wrong. My intuition is wrong or the data is wrong, right? Those are the two options. But I'm not doing any fancy analysis yet. I'm just visually plotting the data to pick out with my brain and my experience what, what the expectations are. That's basically project two for you. So to get a little bit more detail, what's really going on here? So for whatever reason, the power companies split the state of Texas into these different regions. So those different columns of data are the different um, areas of where power is being supplied. So in some sense, I don't care about all the data. I'm just going to pick on one region, but that's sort of like the context of, of where we're going. OK, so now we can do lag plots. And some people, I think, got to this. So if I look at the the lag plot for the east region, we can see that it's it's not a spread out blob of data, right? It's a it's a it's a line, and so that means that our our data is actually a time series. And there wasn't any doubt; it, it is a time series. But just to validate, using a lag plot, yes, it shows it's a time series. Not a surprise. Okay, so your plot that we can use. So lag plots, remember, they're just measuring the difference between adjacent data points. And so if you want to get fancy and look for other sort of oscillations in your data, you can look at the difference between the adjacent data points, and you can look at the difference between the every other data point, and you look at every third data point. And that whole pattern there is the autocorrelation function. So it's how much correlation is there between uh, on different scales of, of difference. OK, so big fancy plot here. Basically, this is a correlogram. And so it's just showing you yep. that there are periodic oscillations. But the longer the correlation, the less confidence you have about that. And so if you really want to be cool, you can use this other library which plots the confidence interval. So like, how confident am I that there are oscillations on the scale of the 100,000 hours? So there's very low confidence out here. But basically, the only things they say is that there's uh, a temporal correlation on the scale of how many hours that is. OK. So that's cool. All right. Let's skip over that part. Then outward coat. All right. So now <laughs> the other trick that we're going to play before we move into the actual decomposition is using what's called a rolling average. So this is a, a strange concept if you haven't thought about it before. So it's going to be a, a bumpy ride. So basically, the idea is, if you have a pen, if I have some data, and this is time, and this is whatever I'm measuring here, 
I can ask, what is the average value of all of these data points? Right? And there's one average, right? It will look like that. That doesn't tell me very much. So often in time series data, what we'll do is call the rolling average. So I'll say, in this window right here, what is the average value? So from here to here, maybe the average is down here. And then I'll say, OK, let's move forward a little bit. So now in this window, what's the average value? Right? Maybe it's a little lower. And then I'll do the next time window all right, and just keep moving forward. And now we've got this little big spike here. So let's say it's moving up a little bit. And so we're moving the window forward, and all these windows overlap. And so eventually what you get back is like a large uh, number of these averages. And if you connect all these moving averages, what you get is a slightly smoother curve. And if you connect these points. So that's the trick. The trick is you've got these windows. You get the average value in each window, and then from those points, you connect them, and you can get a smoother curve, which sort of gets rid of the noise, which is handy because often I don't care about what the actual hour-to-hour -hour change was. I care about sort of what the average change was. So far, so good. You got that? So let's see what that looks like. So the, the strange thing is, once you when you do a rolling average, it's not the the size of the series is not the size of the original, right? Because your first few data points they resulted in one data point, and so that means it's not going to be the same length on this end, and there's going to be some missing data points here. So whenever you do a rolling average, you're shrinking the size of the data. Uh, that's the number of points over which you're averaging. And for that rolling window, we're going to apply the mean function, the average, in that window. So if we look at the first few values out of that, we get back this. Now when we plot that, what we get over all the time series that we have is this curve. This looks way different. Right? Let's compare that with the first data set that we looked at. Way back here. Right. This was our original data set. It looked pretty crowded. It was hard to see what was going on. And so what we've done is we've taken the first five set of points and said, what's the average value? OK, next five set of points, what's the average value? What's the average value? What's the average value? And we did that over and over. And what we got back was a plot that looks way different. So it looks like that. So it's much easier to pick out the annual variation because we've reduced the sort of noise by taking the average of a set of points and moving that along. More specifically, the rolling says pick out a set of values. And so in this case, pick out five values. And then for those five values, apply the mean. You could do a rolling max. That might be cool. It wouldn't, in this case, be that different, I suspect. Let's do max. And then I'm just looking at the first 15 values down here. So let's look at the max 15. I think the plot will mostly be the same. Takes a long, so there's a lot of data. It takes a long time to average. OK, so there's, there's the max of a rolling window of five data points. So the Sorry. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Yes. Yep. So here, to get, I'm going to go back to mean so I don't mess myself up. So here, what I was doing is my window size was 7 times 24. So there's an hourly power measurement. And so I'm taking the average of the week. That means for the year, I'm getting back 52 data points. right? And in this case, I've cleaned that up so that it looks, you can see the annual trends much more easily. So the reason you might want to do this is you, if you're building power infrastructure and you want to say, do I need a new, data, new 
sort of substation, you can look at this pretty easily and say, well, the year-over-year -year trend is pretty stable, right? I can just pick that out visually from the data. Okay, so that's pretty handy. So there's a danger here, right? If I, I can make the data sparser and sparser, so here I've gone uh, 30 days is the rolling window, so now it's the month-to-month -month average. So I'm taking the 24 times 30 data points in my window size, and I'm taking the average of that. So again, this still looks pretty clean. But the problem is, um, once we start getting too sparse, the number of data points actually uh, working out for an average so it starts to break down. So here I've done a two-month average and then uh, a yearly average. And I don't quite understand this myself, but like you start getting this like weird artifacts in your data set. It doesn't quite know how to average the data points. I'm not quite sure why. So you start losing data points. And like at this point, you're doing like, uh, it's trying to do a rolling window over the entire year. That doesn't work out as well. So just like choosing the number of bins, like it's sort of a subjective choice. Same thing here, like you don't want to introduce new artifacts. You do want to remove the noise from your time series data. So yeah, so obviously if you go too big, it just looks like crap, so. Okay, so now the thing that I promised you, seasonal decomposition, it's exciting. All right. So let's, yeah, go down to the bottom. All right, so let's take the first 10 days of our time series data from this uh, east se section. So here's the, the raw observations in one plot. And you can see there's some sort of weekly trends there, right? Over the first 10 days. And, huh? Go down to the bottom. It's the days. So on a daily basis, the power is oscillating. And so what we did was we took our original data, we applied a rolling average to figure out what the trend was. Once you've identified the trend, then you can subtract that from your original data set and get back the oscillations. These oscillations look really clean, right? So that means like every week is the same. Like you might, if, if you put in a holiday in here, you might expect some sort of like difference, but the week to week average is, is pretty consistent. And then once you subtract from your original data, you subtract the trend and you subtract the oscillations, then you're left with the actual noise. So this is like how much variation is there week to week and hour to hour. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Super easy, right? So seasonal decompose, seasonal decompose, that was a library that I pulled in from statsmodel.tsa.seasonal, so it's a library that I use. Yeah. So he's asking, what are the arguments to the seasonal decompose? Let's take a look. Uh, let's see. So we passed in the, let's see, data series, where did that come from? So we took in our east values, and we said for those values, use the index equal to our end. So we just have a series coming in, right? So the head of that series are these values. So far, so good. And we're going to pass that data series to season decompose, and it's going to be additive. We're just saying that all the components add together. And then we're looking for frequencies. We expect them to be on a 24-hour sort of cycle. So that's the reason it knew to decompose these on a 24-hour basis is because we told it that. There's 10 days, I think, and so that's 10 cycles. OK, questions on that? So basically, you can decompose your time series data into uh, a weekly or daily pattern. So we would just look at was a daily cycle. Yeah. Like you want to save the output to it. Yeah. I think you could. Uh, yeah. I think in the result variable, that data would be available. So like.
we're, we're storing the output to a variable and we're just plotting it, but I think there are other operations you can do to it. Yes. April. If I'm interpreting this correctly, you're basically just telling you how it, basically how it is the same all the time, and then the variation there. So like, this is the way it's all the same, and these are the anomalies. Yep. Yep. After you've taken out the rolling average. Yes. Yep. Okay. So then you can also apply the same question to sort of weekly patterns, and you see those pop out. I don't know if there's anything exciting down here. Yeah. Okay. So then, so you can you can pick out sort of like selecting specific years, and then do annual analysis. But basically, all this is going down the same road. So. Okay. That's all in there. Questions on that? So, you were telling me it was like if the trend is like this, then it's easy. But you have to put the trend like this. Yeah, so you have to subtract the. the pattern is the same, but over the time, the things are only increasing. So the pattern remains the same. But if you have Okay, so I'm gonna draw a specific. <laughs> got a bunch of questions going on. I'm gonna answer one question first, and then I'd like to come back to these other ones. All right. So let's say that I have uh, a set of points, and I draw a trend through those set of points. All right. Now, if I know what the equation for that line is, all right. I can figure out what what that line would be if I translated this line to say a, a flat set of values, and if I did that that uh, change to all the data points on the line, I could say, well, this line, this data point was slightly below my original line. This point was slightly above. This one was more above. Same here, and then slightly. So basically, I'm just taking the original line that I fit and making the same translation to all the points with respect to that same line. Th does that answer the question? So basically, we're looking at the linear regression, like, horizontally. Yeah, that's right. Wrote, yeah, shifted. OK. Other, I, heard, I heard other conversations, so there were other questions, I think. <laughs> and we are doing this to do the max correction. Correct. To, to do the oscillate, picking out the oscillations. Yeah, but it, rather than just using a straight line, it uses the moving average as the trend. Okay. Question? <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Sorry. So if you thought that was confusing, hold on, there's one more. <laughs> okay. All right. So the, the last idea is called the Fourier transform. So this is a way of picking out those oscillations. Like, what is the periodicity in the data? All right. Oh, no, not that one. Not sure which one. <laughs> I have to figure out which one I was looking at. Fourier transform. Okay, so the Fourier transform is a little complicated. If you have, who here has seen the Fourier transform before? Heard of it? Heard of it? Okay, that's at least a start. We've got that going for us. Okay, so just like what we just talked about was the fact that we could subtract data from other data to get uh, some underlying patterns. Uh, 
I, well, I would love to have uh, people ask questions, but it's really hard for me to teach when other people are having conversations. So your choice. OK, so the, the, the challenge, so this is an animation. It's very fancy, but it's going to draw basically the same idea. That you can take uh, a curve, any curve, and decompose it into oscillating curves. That's a little more complicated than we were just talking about with trend decomposition. So you can detrend data. Uh, this is a slightly different idea. So okay, I'm going to try and catch this as it goes through. So if I have some curve that looks like some shape, right? This sort of is similar to what we're just looking at. There's a mathematical sort of idea that you can take that one curve and define it as a set of other curves. So how does that work? All right. So I'm going to let that play in the background. But basically, the idea is, if I have a curve that looks like this, I have another curve that looks like this. Oh, let's draw another color. Okay, so I have everyone here. Who is here not familiar with a sine curve? Sine. Okay, sine curves are good. So I have another curve that looks like this. Okay, so it's a different curve, but every value in here I can add, subtract to this other one. So I'm going to add these two curves. All right, so I'm going to add the red one and the black one. We use another color for that. So if I add these two curves, it's like this point right here added to this black curve here, it's going to look a little bit higher. Let's call this zero. So it's, it's, they're additive, so they're both high valued here. And then this one goes down, so let's draw a zero here. So this one is going down, and this one's going up. So on average, they're going to be closer to zero. So now we have to go down. All right, so, so who, who here have I lost? It's, well, it's our zero line, and it's the thing that we're adding about. Only if they're uh, the same size. So like if, 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 if the red curve is high and the black curve is high, the green curve is going to be the of those two. It's going to be even higher. But if the black curve is high and the red curve is low, then they should go down. Right? They'll cl closer to zero if they're the same size. So at this point, the black curve is zero and the red curve is zero. So my green curve, I add those two, plus, I still get zero. Right? So maybe it looks something like that. My red curve is high. My black curve is lower. Maybe I should go <laughs> however we're going to do that. Basically, <laughs> I'm not going to go all the way through this, but this is very negative. So now I have to go way down here. Oh, maybe I got that totally backwards. Oh, yeah, OK, that was the wrong inflection point. No. That's probably why. OK. So I cross this through 0. It goes for down. Now these two are very high, right? So I'm going to have some data point up here. So the idea is I can add these curves. And the resultant green curve eventually is going to look different than the two curves that I started out with. That's the fundamental idea. The cool thing is by having a sufficiently large number of these sine curves, you can construct any other curve by just simple addition and different weights. So you can construct a wave that looks as complicated as this red one from a large number of these blue ones. Right? So you're just decomposing it that way. And that, so what does the Fourier transform tell you? The Fourier transform tells you how much of each of those different sine curves do I need to add in to get the actual curve that I want. So it's sort of like the weights on each of your constituent curves. OK, so far so good? Now, now, what does this have to do with time series, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, took you through a bunch of math. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that, <laughs> that's a different question.
calculations about that uh, detrended data. So that's where the Fourier transforms come in. We'll take a look. Okay. So, so <laughs> I, I said some words. I'm going to back it up with some Python. Right. That's the goal. All right. So a bunch of Python. Blah blah blah. So ignore all this. It's not cool. It's just to set up this curve. Okay. So now I have. I basically imagine I've taken my trend, my my original data, and I've taken the trend line out. So now it's just oscillating about. Um, a, a fixed average, right? So it would look something like this. Agreed? Some cyclic pattern. All right. So the fun part is you can figure out what is what is the sine curve that describes that oscillation. In this case, it is just a sine curve. So there is only one frequency that describes that sine curve. Like there, that's just one pattern here. So we don't have to do any addition. We're just it's a simple sine curve. So that's what the Fourier transform is. Now, suppose that I had two waves, right? And if I have two different sine curves, hopefully you can see that they're two different sort of oscillating sine curves at the same time overlaid with each other. The cool thing is you can apply the Fourier transform to this very noisy looking data, and it will tell you specifically which two different sine curves you would need to add to create those. This is an overly simplistic example because to create this data, I just added two sine curves together. Right? So it shouldn't be a surprise that the Fourier transform tells you, yes, this is really just two different sine curves added together. What are these along with here? Oh. And because those sine curves, here? you have two different values. Yes. So, so the. <laughs> these aren't a so this isn't a, an anomaly. You wouldn't. I guess you can think of this as anomalies, but it's saying what uh, frequency. So I should ask. So this black curve and the red curve, they have different frequencies. So the Fourier transform is answering the question, what different curves do I need to add together to get the data that I have? And so they're different frequencies. Of, you're not adding uh, curve, uh, sine waves of the same frequency. You're adding sine waves of different frequencies. And so the question becomes, Okay, maybe I should ask um, who here knows what a frequency for a sine curve is? <laughs> okay. Okay, yes. So that's why everyone's lost. All right. <laughs> okay, so this, this black curve, so the, the black curve right here, it's going uh, up and then back down, and it's going to have a period. Right? So this is a period. That is this long. So that's like that's one way of characterizing this sine curve oscillation. How long is this? The other way to characterize it is the amplitude. So how high is the curve? Right? So this other curve, the red one, it has a different period. So here the period for the red curve is much smaller, right? And the amplitude is smaller. So we need ways of characterizing the fact that these sine waves are, in fact, different. It turns out that the inverse, so the up one over the period is the frequency. So the frequency of this oscillation, that's usually given in how many oscillations are there per second. So if this were a time, the inverse of that is the frequency. Okay, so the different ways of describing these different sine curves that is characterized by the frequency of that sine curve and its amplitude. So those are the two ways that we characterize it. And so we have to say, if I'm going to add these two different curves together to get this green curve, what are the parameters that specify what the red curve are and what the black curve are? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, sorry. This is the amplitude, and that's the frequency. But same idea, right? So we have so basically from our original data, or from our the data we constructed, there were two sine curves. So we have two different frequencies and two different amplitudes. And just to correct that a little bit, so the amplitude is about 0.5, and the amplitude is 1.5. 
and the frequency, which is the inverse of the period, is 5 and 10. Oh, what was the question? So all of these points here, so if I have a, 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 a sine curve at, say, 20 hertz, that 20 oscillations per second, the amplitude of it is zero. So that means we're going to add this wave, but with zero amplitude, which means it's not going to change anything, right? The if the amplitude, so let's say I had uh, an amplitude that was smaller, but the same period it would look like that, right? And so the smaller and smaller amplitude means there is less and less uh, data to be added into our, our curve. So when the amplitude is zero, that means it has no impact on the data. Okay, I'm going to move along so we can get to the homework. But so <laughs> basically, the idea here is we we are able to decompose uh, temporal data to figure out what the oscillations are in the data. So that's what the seasonal decomposition was doing. You probably won't use the Fourier transform much, but this is basically a notebook of we're getting more and more realistic to figure out like what are the oscillations present in the data and how do you account for those. Okay, so here's the data that looks really noisy, right? but in fact, you can decompose that into a few specific wave functions. These other wave functions are also present very, very small amounts. So I wanted to figure out, let's look at some data that looks really random. Is there a weak-to-weak -week oscillation in the data? If you take a Fourier transform of your really noisy looking data, and you see that there's a spike at the seven, uh, seven day, so whatever that is in hertz, then you could figure out there is actually a seven day recurring pattern, even though visually it's very hard to pick out. Like from this, from this noise, if you had to pick out, is there some cyclic trend, it would be very hard to do visually, right? So at some point, your visual ability to break down data is no longer sufficient, so you need to apply math, right? So like, this data, it'd be hard to pick out the fact that it is, in fact, just two different primary oscillations added together with a bunch of noise. Yeah, would you be able to determine similar oscillations using the other one we did above, where we found the, um, the, the whole anatomy? That's what, that's what that function was doing. It's doing this. Uh, d it's detrended, so you've removed the the sort of slope from it. Okay. So I think I'm going to skip. There's one more notebook which I need to get to because that'll actually show us. We're going to skip over that part. Doc test. All right. So I'm assuming no one here has heard of doc test before because we haven't used them in this class. But the idea is basically when you have a function in Python you can define what that function should provide as sort of an example. So I'm using the triple quotes here. So in my function, I have a set of uh, a comment, basically, that has this string format that's called the doc string. And so uh, here's a comment. And then basically, I have these three arrows here. That's like a Python prompt. And then I have, I call the function with some input. And I, get, I should get this output. Right? This is sort of like a, a documentation of expectations for the function. And so what you're going to have as homework is I'm going to give you a function that has a doc test in it. So it's going to look something like this. And I'm going to say, you should be able to produce an output that looks like this. All right. So in this function, I'm going to cheat. All right. So don't do this on your homework. This is the wrong thing to do. I'll show you what I did. I said, if you pass me this string, just print Wednesday. I'm done. <laughs> Obviously, it passes the doc string test, right? OK, that's not what it should happen, but let's run this. OK, so when I run this doc test function against uh, the notebook, it's going to look and see that this function has uh, a defined doc test in it. And so it's going to test both of those conditions on that function. 
Uh, let's see. So it failed. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. It attempted to and failed neither of them. So it was a good thing, right? So it did actually put out the expected result. If we do a, an, another function with the same doc test, but we just put in a wrong answer, like here we're just going to return the word hello, then doc test is going to complain pretty noisily. So it's going to say, I tried to do this, and what I expected was this, but what I got was that. So the test failed. Right. And then, because this, this function had another doc test in it, so it's also going to try that one. And it's going to say, I tried to do, I tried to pass an argument into your function, and I thought I was going to get this, but in, instead I got that. So your both tests failed. Right. So what I'm looking for in the homework is that when you, <laughs> so, so don't do this, right? This would be naughty. You won't get any credit for that. But I actually want you to do a transformation in your function so that when I pass in something that looks like this, I actually get the right day of the week. All right. So basically, you will be actually given that same set of doctoring tests uh, in a notebook as an assignment that you will download the notebook from Blackboard and then fill in that function appropriately. Questions on that? It means you're going to have to parse a string, right? Convert that into a date time, figure out what day of the week it is, and then tell me what the day of the week is. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I didn't tell you. So it's just this. Well, I mean, the question is what will you have to do, right? Right. So if I give you something that like is the word cat, then you'll have to say like that doesn't work. Right? Your function will fail. Okay. Still question? Uh, you can skip the time zone. Just consider it UTC. Yeah. Okay. The second problem is on uh, what's called MP. <laughs> you guys are really not happy. All right. So I give you a bunch of Excel spreadsheets. And in each Excel spreadsheet is some time series data. Not surprisingly, it's a time series class, right? So the question for you is, is the data in the Excel spreadsheet a time series or not? Correct. Number three. If it's a line. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a blob of data, then it's not. All right. And then if you're going to write a notebook that parses the data. All right. It's going to be in Excel, so you have to load the Excel data into the notebook. And then once you figure out which one it is, you're going to take the corrective action. I have properly scared everyone, and I apologize. <laughs> no, my, my goal is to seriously, my goal is to make you into badass data scientists. So this is the only road I know. Okay. 